Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, um, even if online. Um, I am also returning to face-to-face -face meeting, but the reason why I am not there is that um, I was recently in Korea in late September. Um, now I am in the middle of the teaching season, so I couldn't uh, go that far and for that long for the second time within the semester. So I apologize for not being there uh, in person. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be um, in Dynamics Days um, as this is a conference in which I have been already before when in, once in the Europe and once in the US, but uh, never in Asia. So it's, it's a, a good opportunity to let you know a little bit about what we do uh, in, in our group. Um, the, the talk of today is about, uh, it's a sort of summary of what we have been doing during the last few years um, on contagion dynamics. Um, I would like to to start by um, making a sort of summary of, of where we started and where we are now. So I will drive you through our path, exposing a few key results that I think we have found um, in, in our uh, research. So the first thing is that uh, I will refer to contagion dynamic, but mostly to disease spreading. Contagion um, is, is, um, is a term that also encompasses, for example, social contagion and is not necessarily um, disease dynamics. It could be the spread of behavior, for example, or, or the spread of uh, adoptions of, of fashion, etc. But um, let's use the language of, of disease dynamics, which I think is, is more um, uh, maybe illustrative of, of the sort of things that we are going to do. And if we talk about disease, we need to also realize that uh, this field of computational epidemiology slash network epidemiology is a field that has grown a lot in the last 20 years. And this grow in, in our capability to model real diseases is something that um, has um, root in, in science, in basic science, with the discovery of networks and with the availability of a lot of data about contact networks, but it's also a necessity because there have been a lot of new emerging diseases since the last in the last 20 years. And this map only shows a few of them. As you can see, there are quite a few of them. Um, we have still we are in, in one of the we're in the biggest pandemic of our recent times. Um, and therefore it more or less have contributed to also boost even more our capability of doing disease dynamics uh, with the aim of forecasting uh, what would be the course of the disease or what kind of interventions could work, what others intervention might not work, etc. Of course, the problem is not easy. The problem of simulating a disease or a social contagion process in general is not easy. And you have to have uh, to take into account at least um, a few um, elements in your model. The first one is you need to know how the disease is transmitted. And this is something that, um, that we have learned the hard way in, 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 when COVID. We thought that it was sort of transmitted like a flu or, or similar diseases. And the first measures that were adopted were supposed to work because you were supposed to be symptomatic, et cetera, and this didn't work. Um, so you need to know what are the disease stage as well. And finally, um, all these, or at least the, the diseases that I am I will be discussing are human transmit. So it's transmitted by humans with the need without the need of, of, of anything else. So it's human to human transmission. There are other diseases like um, um, vector bone diseases in which you need to add a second layer that would be the vector. But in our case, it's human to human transmission. And one key aspect when you go to model real diseases is to take into account human behavioral change. And this is really, really difficult because we have made a lot of advance in the first two um, points. We know how to mathematically characterize 
characterize the diffusion of the disease the, the, in terms of equations, in terms of modeling techniques, in terms of data. We know how to um, deal with diseases that are very complex in, in, in the natural history of the disease, but we don't know very well how to deal with human behavioral change. Numerically, we can incorporate a few of the things that we can measure in human behavior, but uh, theoretically, there is no equation, let's say, that I can plug into my system of differential equations to model human behavior. And this is where the major challenge is, I think, uh, right now for network and computational epidemiology or mathematical epidemiology. So the first of how it's transmitted, I mean, it's, it's by human and humans move around, human move, and when human move, um, they, they they carry the disease and transmit to others. This is just short video um, showing um, a few years ago the uh, airport transportation uh, around Europe and specifically uh, around the hub of London Heathrow. Um, and you can guess that um, if when the Black Death was, um, you know, um, killing a lot of people, millions of people in Europe. Uh, it took like three and a half years to go from the Southern Europe to Northern Europe. Now you can go from one place of the globe to another place of the globe in, in less than 24 hours. So that also has changed dramatically the tiny scale associated with the disease of transmission. This is something that we need to take into consideration in our model because there is no any more spatial scale associated with the transmission is more in terms of effective distance and effective distance are in this case given by the communication between different points and between different cities etc so the system is is really complex and on top of that as i already said humans adapt we should principle make predictions harder and just to show you how easy it is for a human to change their behavior, let me put an example of an experiment that was done in the in a department. I think it was a mathematical department in the in, in, in a university in the United Kingdom. Um, this is a three-page paper that I recommend if, if you want to read something that is really entertaining, but at the same time very uh, enlightening. Uh, it's an experiment in which participants must pay for the. There was a, um, a room, the typical room in the apartment in which you can go and uh, have a blackboard, coffee, tea dispensers, and, and a few uh, coach, etc., in which you can sit and talk to, you, to your colleagues. Um, the rules uh, to consume tea and, and coffee uh, are that participants must pay for the meal consumer with coffee or tea. So coffee or tea is free of charge, but if you put milk, then you have to pay for that. Uh, the amount due is fixed, but each of, of, of the people, um, of the consumers decide whether to pay or not. So if you pay, you have to pay a fixed amount, let's say, it's, I don't know, 20 cents, uh, they put some image. This is not a screen that is interactive. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. That. So it was uh, some break. Is, um, uh, for, sorry. For, is, um, maybe if you is need a, a couple photo, of sentences. It's just uh, an image that is there. And they change the image uh, every week. So one with flowers, then eyes, flowers, eyes of different intensity, etc. And then they try to find the association or correlation between what was shown and what was collected uh, in the model. And this is how, uh, this is what, uh, what uh, people were um, depositing in the, in, in the collectors as a function of the image. As you can see, um, there is a lot of variability um, uh, in the amount of pay per liter of milk consumed per week and as a function of the image. So physicists would say it, uh, humans can be fine-tuned, but it's true in the sense that you see that an image that is something that is not moving, something that it will have no consequence on you because um, there is no one that will tell you anything about it. 
but you change your behavior as a function of what you are seeing. So this is it's an example of interaction with the environments. Imagine in the middle of a disease with so much sources of information, uh, so much confusion, confusion, et cetera, how you actually take into account the plenty of human reactions uh, to the uh, presence of the disease that you could observe in your system. So this is a huge problem that we still don't know how to solve uh, pretty, pretty, I mean, mathematically speaking. Um, then uh, there is the mathematical model that uh, we used to use very simple models like the, the type of SIR model in which you can have different uh, compartments for the susceptible, the infective and the recover or, or remove, if, if you want to call it better. Um, then between the susceptible and the infected, you can also include latency states, et cetera. Um, you can also make it um, um, depending on, on time in, as a function of, of the uh, death rates or birth rates, so the population is not closed, but it's open, so people could die for other causes not related to the disease, etc. And you can actually complicate quite a bit this, for example, for COVID-19, once you know the natural history of the disease, you can do sort of SIR model, but still, but very much, uh, I mean, more complex than that, because then you will have a susceptible um, <clears throat> um, a compartment, then you have all this here is related to the latency stage. So you have two branches, one that is asymptomatic, another one that is symptomatic. And where you go from one or the other depends on, on genetic susceptibility. Well, it still is not clear, but uh, um, it's something that you can somehow quantify. Um, and then you, if you are symptomatic, you first, uh, before being infectious, you are what is called presymptomatic. <clears throat> In the presymptomatic phase, you are uh, able to transmit the, the, the disease, well, in this case, <clears throat> the virus. Um, and then you become infectious, and then you can have different degrees of severity. You can end up uh, in the hospital, ICU, etc. Most interesting is that also the spreading rate here uh, depends on who transmits the disease because it's proportional to the viral load. So it depends on on, on this three stage here, uh, the amount. I mean, how likely it is that you get it uh, from the contact that you have had. Um, so in general, when you solve these sort of of models, you get this sort of phase dynamic, in which you find that there is a disease-free regime and and a, disease active regime in which that corresponds to an outbreak. Um, and this is um, determined by what is called the reproduction number, the basic reproduction number, which is uh, um, the average number of secondary infectious individuals that are produced by a single infected individual in a fully susceptible population. This is the definition of the basic reproduction number. Of course, when the disease start to um, evolve, um, you don't find a lot of, um, of, of the conditions of the definition, like for example, the, the, the population is not fully susceptible still, et cetera. So you work with what is called effective R, or, or if you want the, the temporal um, R, which is again the same. If R is equal to one or, or below, uh, well, if it's equal to one, you are right in the critical line. So it does not grow, but it does not decline. If R0 is larger than one, it means that on average, you generate more than one infective. The infective, so the process start growing. And this is uh, uh, the famous exponential growth because it's exponential um, um, in, in that phase. Um, if R0 is smaller than one, or RT, if you want the temporal R is smaller than one, that means that on average, you are producing less uh, infect, new infected individuals than those that you already have at time T. So that means that it's declining and that sooner or later, the epidemic will, will disappear and, 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 and you will uh, finish with the outbreak. So this is the... the basic uh, epidemiological um, 
it's, I mean, it's basic in epidemiology and, and then whatever you do is to try to reduce R as much as possible. So if you implement, uh, we are masking, um, um, you know, um, lockdowns, etc. the objective of this is to reduce R0. And you try to reduce R0 with these measures because this R depends on a few things. This R depends Previous, uh, first of all, on the properties of what is being transmitted. So the disease um, spreading rate, the recovery rate of individual, because it's also important how long you are infectious. So the longer you are infectious, the more new infectives you can produce. And the number of contacts that you have is also really critically important. It's not the same that you isolate and you have no contact to transmit the disease or that you are, I don't know, a public servant, for example, I am a teacher, I am teaching in a class full of students, so I am um, potentially transmitting the disease to a lot of students. So this is the, the number of, of, of contacts that you have. And here is where networks enters into place. Here is where we need to take into account how people um, interact, how people um, mix together. And this is something that has been started. A lot of data have been collected, a lot of data have been mining, and a lot of data have been assembled to describe precisely how human um, collective behavior uh, occurs. Sorry, I, I have seen so a couple of messages about um, that my internet is is not stable. So I'm sorry if this is interrupted at times. Um, so one of the uh, of of the few of the first things that you need to do when you try to characterize this network of interactions is to measure different uh, patterns. And one of these patterns is what is called contract matrices. Um, contact matrices are matrices that tells you how likely it is that a person of a given age um, interacts with another person of the same age or another age. So it's a matrix and, and you can start filling there. Um, this is something that has been measured in different countries. And for example, you see here two examples, one that is from 2005 or the project that is called Polymod, and another one that is from Zimbabwe in 2013. One is in Europe, another one is in Africa, and you see that the contact patterns are completely different. That means that the same model um, have to be fed with different data if you want to really get a statistical results that are compatible with what you observe in reality. Um, so either you measure all these in all countries, or then you have to develop some um, methods that allows you to infer um, this uh, from population data. And this is what we did in this paper that uh, I, I, I leave the reference there if you want to check, but essentially try to answer to the question how to transform an empirical contract matter that has been obtained for a given uh, demographic structure, Poland, Zimbabwe, or whatever, into a different contract matrix that is compatible with a different demography. And a different demography in this case means another country or the same country at another time, if you have the how the population, the pyramid, the, the demographic of the population have evolved. So this is something that we solve uh, in this paper. And, and then with that, you can plug in into the model. Why is this important? Because there are some diseases, not only uh, COVID-19, that critically depend depends on the age of the individuals. And one of these examples is tuberculosis. And here I, I am showing you a very complex model that um, we developed to study transmission uh, dynamics of tuberculosis disease. And it was in, in the upper left um, corner, you see the natural disease, the, the history, I mean, the compartmental model that represents the natural history of, of tuberculosis. And you see that is much, much complex than a SIR model because you have susceptibles, you have late in the states, but then you have a lot of different outcomes of the disease um, and treatment outcomes because tuberculosis is really complex because it's not a disease that lasts like one week like a flu or maybe two or three weeks like the COVID-19. Um, it's a disease that if everything is okay, you need like six months of treatment with antibiotics, is a, a bacterium in this case, with antibiotics 
to get rid of of the of of the disease and and and, and curate, let's say, and go to the healthy state again. So you need that long time and. If you isolate while you are in treatment, then you are not a spreader anymore. But if you don't isolate, you continue to spread the disease. And, and then this means that you have to follow the disease through a lot, a lot of time. So a very huge time windows. And this makes contact tracing, et cetera, a lot more complex. Um, most importantly, for what we were discussing, the um, the disease is highly depending on the age, so you need to take into account these contact matrices. And what we did here was to develop a data-driven model in which you fit with a lot of data, a mathematical model to adjust parameters, and then you can do forecasts. That uh, these forecasts, uh, of course, depends on, on the country, as you can see here, and, and also not only on the country, but depends also on how the population demography will evolve. Uh, these five here um, depends on, on how this evolves. For example, if you are in this uh, number three, this is, let's suppose, as of today, then you have two choices. One, like in Africa, is that the the Morafi pyramids, it's its growth in the younger population. And another, like uh, the developed country, is tends to be um not like, like the African, but tends to be more populated in the elderly population because we the expectation of life is growing, etc. And, and natality rates are decreasing. So the pyramid is is inverted in, with respect to other countries. And you see that depending on, on which of these uh, is the evolution of your population, you have different incidents and different impact of, in, of the disease in the population. And this is pretty, pretty interesting because um, um, we live in a globalized world, but for this case, being this sort of, um, of disease, we need to go to local patterns to study and to characterize the evolution of the disease. This is not the only methods that we can use, the differential equations, etc. There are other things that we can study also and that have become uh, very important if you want to address contagion dynamics or if you want a more general term disease dynamics. Um, and there are other methods. Um, the first one uh, on the left top corner is, is, is the metapopulation models. And this is used when you want to study the large scale spreading of the disease, for example, for uh, the initial stage of the COVID, there were a lot of studies trying to find how the disease will go from one country to the other, this geographical spread um, of the disease using uh, metapopulation models in which each of these um, nodes is a subpopulation. So a subpopulation could be a city, a urban area, a province, etc., or even a country. And then connections between these subpopulations are given by mobility uh, patterns. So it could be a flight, a direct flight, a train connection, high waves, whatever. And then you, 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 what you measure here is how many subpopulations are infected, given that the initial outbreak was in, the, in, in, in a single subpopulation. Um, at the level of the cities, you can also use these multi-layer networks um, that are very um, convenient when you have high resolution data about how people are distributed in your population. Normally what you do is to divide in at least four layers your, your populations at the city level, and then you assign to each of the layers different dynamics, different um, contacts or different type of contacts, etc. For example, one is a school layer, uh, a school at all levels of education from primary school to university, college, etc. <coughs> you include there this because it's, it's a very typical uh, or it's a very recognizable, let's say, uh, situation in which you have everyone in a, in a classroom. From time to time, there is some mixing, but most of the mix is in the classroom. So you know how many people are in the classroom for how many time, who interact with who's there, etc. And if you do, for example, contact tracing survey, this is something that comes out very naturally because people will remember, oh, I was in class and these are my teammates or my classmates. So 
I can tell you who I interacted with today. And this is one layer that you have. The second one that is something more or less similar to this is the workplace layer. You remember who are your um, co-workers and, and if you are asked, you can name them. Of course, the household layer because most of the time you are in the household um, and you also remember that. And finally, probably the most important but most known layer is what we call community layer. And it's everything that you cannot encode in any of these three layers. And essentially is what we, when we say that is where um, encounters happens at random so when you are in a bar taking a coffee when you go to a restaurant when you take a transportation means etc um, if you are asked to tell me um, who are your contacts probably you can guess well i have interacted with 10 20 people or maybe more i don't know but i cannot tell you the names because i don't know those people so this makes contact tracing really really um difficult and that's why some contact tracing apps are useful because what what they are aiming is to um try to reveal what i cannot tell you because i don't know the people with whom i interacted so um, these two uh, approaches has been used quite quite often to characterize also disease dynamics. Um, in some sense, um, using the tools of complex networks or network theory, um, before a 2011 20 layer networks in which we only have one layer of, in which one host population, I think, which the disease is being transmitted. And then from 2011, 2012, more or less, with uh, uh, the development of the theoretical framework that allows to characterize and study multi layer networks, we've um, more complex problems, more complex contagion processes, like, for example, what happens when two diseases are interacting. And this is very interesting and very um, timely because there are some diseases that um, interact um, uh, very heavily and modify the course of the other disease. And I will go, I, I will skip this. Uh, I will go directly to the point. So the idea is that if you have a host population, this host population can be affected by different diseases. Normally, what we assume is that the disease have its network of contacts and it's alone and it's like one layer. But there are some cases in which diseases interact because the presence of one disease alters the way in which the other disease is transmitted or the impact of the other disease. One clear example of this is the co-occurrence of tuberculosis and HIV. Uh, in these two maps, you see the situation of tuberculosis incidence uh, per 100,000 population in Africa before the HIV uh, sorry, before um, the the outbreak of the HIV in Africa, you see that roughly the numbers were between 200, 300. Most of Africa was below 100 or so, with uh, just uh, one or two countries with uh, an incidence larger than 400 cases per 100,000 population. Um, this is 1990s when the HIV just started around that age, in the late, late 80s or something. And then 15 years later, you see that the map have completely changed and all the incidence of the tuberculosis has reached uh, very high levels um, uh, And here. Then you see the percentage here, these numbers indicate the percentage of HIV incidence in the population. And you see that is very, very much correlated one with the other. And this is easy to explain. It's not easy to model, but it's easy to explain. And the reason is that, as you know, the HIV, um, for HIV to spread, you, what what, uh, what happens when you are thick um, is, is that your immune system is depressed, is suppressed. And this opens the door to many opportunistic, um, to many infections. And one of those is tuberculosis. Normally what happens as well, when you get the, the bacteria, the tuberculosis is that your immune system, if you have a normal immune system, your immune system um, tries to kill the pathogen. And what happens is that the macrophage of your immune system eats the, the let's say, the pathogen and, and gets encapsulated. It doesn't kill completely, but it, it encapsulates the, the pathogen so that it's not freely circulating in your blood, it's just there, you are latent, but you are not sick, and you could be in that state for the 
rest of your life, provided that your immune system keeps being strong enough to keep the the macro the the pathogen encapsulated by the macrophage. Uh, if you have an episode of immune suppression like HIV, then this equilibrium breaks out and, and then um, you get sick of tuberculosis. And this is what happens essentially, and that's why uh, the incidence of tuberculosis increases. The way in which you can model this is to represent two diseases in two different layers. Another example of this is the interactions between COVID and flu. This is data from the World Health Organization, in which you see that when COVID was there, flu was completely suppressed. In this case, it's not exactly because of biological mechanisms of the COVID-19 um, disease. It's just because the measures that we adopted to avoid COVID-19 were also very effective for flu. So you need to take into account that one disease, the behavioral reaction to one disease affected the way in which the other propagated to the point in which there was no almost no incidence of the second disease. So if you want to study this, this is something that you need to take into account. Actually, COVID-19 is such a big disruption that when you have models like, for example, tuberculosis, in which you calibrate your data, we using data from you, you calibrate your model, sorry, using data from one decade or two decades. Uh, so just to get all the parameters calibrated, etc. Uh, from now on, it will, in which in the case of tuberculosis, it, it's an increase in the incidence because that diagnosis rate, um, diagnosis rate was um, I mean is 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 um, lower than 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 before. That will that will um, have uh, as a consequence that you will see an increase in TV cases reporting in the next. Uh, few years, etc. So how to model this sort of thing? So normally what we do with this is to model two layers that are connected. In one layer, one disease is propagating, another layer, the other disease is propagating. And this is um, really um, uh, very basic exercise, uh, but most meaningful because um, a disease um, a host population, the host population is the same, but the network of contacts does not necessarily have to be the same. For example, in the case of HIV, it's sensible to assume that it will be a sort of heterogeneous network because HIV is transmitted by um, sexual contacts, and this has been shown to be um, heavy tail. Uh, so this is one thing, but tuberculosis is airborne disease. So it's a, a disease that is not transmit um, by networks that could be some heavy tail network or something like that. It's more kind of well mixed, or if you want um, the the contact patterns that are randomly in population, etc., um, give rise to a sort of negative binomial distribution for the number of contacts of a given individual. So the two networks will be different, and you can then. Um, Coupled to those uh, to that topology, simple models like um, SIS or SIR, etc. I will not enter into details. You can do some math and calculate a few things. The most important thing is that, for example, when you have uh, what is called mutual enhancement, so the presence of one disease impacts the uh, the other one because it makes the other more dangerous or propagate faster, etc. These are results from numerical simulations. So this is disease one, this is disease two. And then you start from initial phase in which you introduce the first disease, but the second one is not introduced. So the incidence is zero. Black here corresponds to zero and red more and just yellow is, is the, the, the highest level of incidence. Then you let times go and you see that when the second one starts kick off, you see that there, the threshold that you observe is not the one that you will expect that this is this one is smaller than this one, just because there is a huge or, or already an important uh, incidence of the first disease that makes this more um, harsher or it's more, more dangerous than, than it was before. So the threshold is below that. This is what in epidemiology is called secondary threshold. Uh, the first one is the primary, and this is a secondary threshold. That is a threshold that you will not, that is 
um, is is a threshold that appears when the, the when the disease is not uh, completely taking place in an isolated population. There are other factors that you have to take into account. Of course, the second disease will also impact if you let the dynamics um, evolve for a longer time. Also, will impact the the first disease because they are mutually enhancing. You have the same uh, effect, but on the contrary, if one disease confers partial cross immunity to the other, this is the case, for example, of two strains of, of the flu. Normally, when you have flu, there are more than one strain. And, and if you get one strain, say, influenza type A, um, or you get also some degree of immunity to influenza type B, or, or et cetera. So, this is, uh, in this case, the, the, the effect is the contrary. So it increases, it's beneficial because it increases the, the, the threshold of the second one. Um, of course, you can complicate this and, and put as SIR dynamics as well, not so only SIS, SIR dynamics. It, it makes you a little bit more cumbersome to find some solutions because now the phase diagram uh, is uh, more complex. Or, or I mean the phase diagram, the, the space of possibilities is more complex and you have few more parameters. And there is one thing that is also very important. Previously, it doesn't matter when you introduce the second disease here because we were talking about SIS. So this disease was already set in, 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 the, in the system and then you introduce the second disease. But in SIR, is a process in which you start, then it peaks, and then it declines. So you have a finite amount of time to introduce the second disease, because if you introduce the second disease too late, the first one will be already ended, and they will not really interact. So this is the temporal, the time, uh, the temporal the, uh, scale of the of the disease spreading. What matters here? So in this sense. Um, uh, here are results of what happens for different uh, times in which you can introduce a second disease and different topologies. This is um, sort of scale-free. This is Erdos Renji. Um, here is you introduce the disease at the very, very, very beginning. And you see that for this, almost you get the same patterns because they are propagating more or less at the same time. Then you introduce the disease when, um, one peaks and and then you see again that this is also um, not very um, let's say doesn't have too much impact in the other one because um, this is the scale free and 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 already the hops has been infected etc. But what happens is very interesting is what happens in if you have homogeneous networks in which you see that the two incidence uh, curves are are kind of um, affected by when you introduce. Um, if you introduce uh, Jeter, you have eight, a few this minutes. one doesn't modify a threshold and the threshold is more or less the one that it will have um, if um, nothing happens. But if you introduce this very early, you see that it, it modifies the threshold um, and then the disease is, is not transmitted in the same way. Anyway, um, the message here, the threshold depends on the time evolution of the other disease. In this case, we are talking about thresholds, not incidence levels and, and outbreaks. That's, uh, so the, the, the last thing that is about social contagion is not uh, anymore about disease. I would like to have to leave a few minutes so I, would, I wouldn't go um, into details here. I would just like to mention that this, or, this same framework you can use to describe contagion in social system using SI-like models. And in this case, um, what is transmit is information or is behavior, is adoption of fashion, et cetera in which you write down the question that describes what is the probability that a given individual is infective at time t plus one, given that you know the state of individual at time t. Uh, you can do this and the most important thing or the most important, let's say, uh, methodological innovation here is that we introduce this contact matrix here that is not the genesis symmetry, but is the probability that you interact with one of your contacts. So this is exactly uh, the same after the agency matrix. If the number of 
trials or the number of, of times that you uh, try to contact with your neighbor is infinity. If this is infinity, this is exactly equal to the agency matrix. But if you have 10 contacts and you only try once, of course, you cannot contact with everyone. You will contact with one and you will contact with one proportional to the degree of that individual. So if you try this many, many, many times, of course, at the end of the day, you will contact with all your neighbors. So that's why we, we we say that this is a family of models that are defined by lambda e, that is um, the contacts per time, the number of contacts per unit time. If the contacts is the number of contacts per unit time is equal to infinity, this is the GCC matrix. If not, it's a matrix that is uh, anyway, accounting for the number of contacts that you have. So you can actually solve this, this equation um, and, and you find that because this is a fixed point equation, you find that the threshold is this one. And this means that the threshold or these are not that we were talking about is proportional to one over the largest in value of the, of the, of this matrix R matrix. This could be also formulated for multi-layer networks. I will not enter into detail because I'm running out of time. Uh, but again, the result is, is the same, is that the um, a threshold or the critical properties of the system are determined by the largest of the largest in value of each agency matrix of this R matrix corresponding to each of the layers in your system. Um, we can solve some, we can do some math to find this, but essentially what you find is that at first order, this largest in value of the whole supra GCC matrix is proportional or is the same after largest of the largest in value of each individual layer. So let me finish just to mentioning what we are doing now. Uh, sorry, uh, what we are doing now is to, oops, uh, I was too optimistic with the number of the slides. So what we are doing now is to study these processes, this uh, complex contagion and, and disease dynamics on top of higher order system on what we call hypergraph. Hypergraph is what you see here. So this is the projection, the graph representation of this hypergraph. But as you see here, interact, these uh, interactions take place in, in groups. So it's not pairwise interaction anymore. Here you see that these are the vertices. You have eight vertices, but the set of H of edges are four edges. So this is H1 that encompasses a group interaction of three individuals. This is H2 that have four individuals. So H3 that have three, a uh, two, and, and this is isolated node. That is not equivalent to this because this will imply pairwise interactions between individuals. So the question here is, what are the consequences of group interactions? What are the consequences of this? And to do this, you can also use a sort of SII dynamics, but in this case, it's a critical mass dynamic. So you, you consider that the group is activated when a number of its nodes are active. So this, and, and this gives you a, a, a sort of, a, a, uh, family is a uh, gain of possible models in which you can, by tuning these parameters, you can play with the uh, critical mass dynamics. So how many people you need to be active to consider that the group is active. If you solve this model, you find a lot of interesting things like um, um, a mix of transitions from that go from continuous, typical continuous second order phase transition to hybrid transition to first order transi transmi transitions. <coughs> Intermittent dynamics characterized by the stability and multi-stability of the states, etc. So I will not enter into it. I apologize because I was really very optimistic. I, I wouldn't have time to this. I will just left. So uh, you were out and were frozen. Uh, so uh, is it possible maybe from the audience uh, is the question? If not, so could you please answer the question from the chat? For how much of the difference between countries can demography account? Oh. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, um, the 
I don't know how to quantify it. Um, I mean, uh, the specific amount, we know how to quantify it, but I don't have the exact figures right now. But um, it depends a lot on, on the disease, um, how the disease depends on the age of the population. Um, um, because for example, we know that there are, um, for, for, all, for some diseases, um, age plays no role, but what is important is how the population is mixed together. So the number of contacts an individual has. And for other diseases, the number of contacts is not important. What is important is the demography. And for other diseases like COVID-19, both themes are important. So who is interacting with who? how many times, um, um, et cetera. So um, it's true that um, this is have to be to, to take to be taken into account. And this is really hard to measure because of the behavioral be, uh, change that I was mentioning. Um, one thing that we have characterized it for COVID-19 within Europe, it could account for at least 15% of variability in the incidence data, uh, one five. Uh, percent of variability so is not you know 50 80 percent of difference but it's something that is already um, macroscopic that is measurable and that uh, can account for um, difference between between this is the global easy so the easy is the full full population if then you go by age you see um, larger differences, especially in the elderly. That is where uh, most of the death were in in COVID nineteen. So it it depends on the country, um, depends on the question that you make, etc. But it's it could be quantified if you plug into the model these demographic data and contact matrices. So uh, can I ask uh, one question? So we know that in many countries, so many groups have made a lot of attempts to model and to predict uh, development of uh, current COVID pandemic. Uh, how you estimate these efforts? Are there stories of success? Because so what sometimes people are rather disappointed that no modeling could really give a good predictions or maybe we are wrong. Oh, well, I think that, um, you know, um, it depends on, on what are your expectations in terms of, of what you want. One thing that is, in, is, is important to distinguish is what is a forecast and what is a prediction. So normally you have two things that you can do. You have your model and then you can predict how the disease will evolve. And this you can do in a very short time window. If you want to predict the, the disease in one month time, this is not going to work. So you have to predict only a few next days and um, mostly uh, at most one week or so, because it has been shown that uh, the very dynamics of your model doesn't allow you to predict uh, for, I mean, uh, longer than that. This is one thing. The other thing is to evaluate a scenarios. If you want to do a scenario evaluation, this is all counterfactual. This is something which is what people see normally. And this is why people seem that it fails. It doesn't fail um, because what you are doing is actually is what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? So this is not something that you are modeling how the disease is actually evolving. You are just placing hypotheses and evaluating what will happen if that. In that specific regard, we have been very successful. Um, and there are a lot of, of groups uh, in US, in Europe, in Asia as well, that have done a, a lot of very good modeling effort to make recommendation to policymakers say, okay, you cannot do this, or if you do this, you will expect 10% increase or, or, or more people in the hospital, et cetera. What happens at the very beginning was that this disease was completely now, the natural history of the disease. As I show, when you do the modeling, you need to in incorporate as many details of the natural disease as possible. And that was uh, the first mistake between quotation that uh, modelers made, it was that assumed that the natural history was simpler than what uh, it was actually 
shown later. So asymptomatic transmission played a big role and that was not taken into account in the very, very initial models, etc. Different degrees of severity, behavioral change of the population. So one of these examples is, in, is a study in the US that was commissioned into a group. They developed a very sophisticated model, mathematically very solid, etc. And they incorporated as many details as possible. Uh, it, it was to model the spread of the disease within a uh, university, uh, just to help the university to adopt some, some measures. Uh, and, and the model failed. Uh, the model failed because only one thing that was traced back later. The model assumed that people that were infected with COVID will follow instructions and will quarantine the students in this case will quarantine and will isolate and they didn't a few of them they didn't and that was the reason why the model failed the prediction of the model failed so it's not a problem with the model is that the model didn't take into account something that was supposed not to happen so this is where we are moving in this sort of things. It's really, really complicated. It's not the problem of the models many, many times. You cannot ask the model to tell you more than what is, you know, I'm for. Okay, so thank you. So we see so that current development also creates a lot of jobs in this community. And uh, yeah. thank you very much for your presentation. So with which we close the session. Thank you.